segment today, our guest who joins us from Southern California is somebody that, uh, you know, it's one of those moments when I go, when the hell haven't I interviewed this guy before? And the funny thing is, I have his first book, and uh, I read it years ago, and we've just kind of been, I guess, um, dancing on the edges, but the real answer, it's all timing, the real answer is that he wrote the book that fits into Off Planet Radio. That's 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 really the thing. He's the author of Shimmering Light Lost in an MK Ultra House of Anu. And his name is Walter Busley. And he is with us from Southern California. He is a world traveling author, researcher, explorer of extraordinary phenomena. He served as a counterintelligence specialist during the final years of the Cold War for the FBI and as a special agent with the Air Force Office of Special Investigations running counter-espionage operations. For the past few years, he has been a personal security and anti-terrorism consultant for corporate and private clients around the world. He also has his own publishing house, Lost Continent, Lost Continent Library Publishing. And he is, um, well, he is the author of many works, including his work on English explorer Richard Francis Burden. He is with us tonight to talk about his present work, which features the story inter intertwining around his own father and his own personal experiences into the paranormal. We welcome Walter Bosley. Welcome to Off Planet. Hey, it's uh, good to be here. Thanks for having me on. I, I'm looking forward to our talk. Yeah, you know, it's funny because uh, I, like I said, I've been aware of your work for a long time. I read the original Empire of the Wheel book back in the day. And then off and on over time, I've, I've looked at some of your other titles. And, uh, you know, I got to say that, that when I read the original Empire of the Wheel book, it was one of those books that, that I went through it uh, trying to immerse myself in it and getting pulled deeper and deeper into the drama. It's an amazing book. But what you've done over the years since you, you did the original Empire of the Wheel book, you've kind, of, you've kind of spun off into some areas. Everything feels like it connects, Walter. It feels like each book you do, there's another piece of a puzzle. Or tell us a little bit about how you got into writing this type of work, how you got into writing and how you got into the arc of the work that you've been doing during your writing career. Well, first of all, thanks for, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking a look at all my stuff to begin with, because, um, you know, in the, in that, in that first book, I know it can get kind of confusing because Rick and I were just, you know, throwing this big mystery at the reader. What happened was um, I had I had done the book on Disneyland and wanted to continue that research, specifically that uh, the, for those not familiar with it, Latitude 33, Key to the Kingdom, is a book I did about Disneyland. Um, uh, apparently I forgot to mention that. Yeah, on the uh, on the intersection of three telluric currents, or as we colloquially refer to them, uh, ley lines. Ley lines, yeah. And um, uh, uh, these these ley lines spread throughout Southern California, but in the Disneyland book, I'd only focused on how they had possibly affected Disneyland. Well, what I wanted to do, like you know, a year later, um, was to see where else those 
those lines extended to from this intersection, and if there were, you know, any other reports of strange phenomena associated with those lines that intersected Disneyland. Um, and what I was actually doing was following through on, um, you know, a report of a ghost story, a haunting at a local mall. And when I met with the source of this haunting story, a local librarian by the name of Ann Walker, um, she told me this very interesting story about the woman who she believes was the ghost haunting the mall. And she told me to take a look at the newspaper reports, which I did. And it, this it is the mall at Inland Empire, right? This is the Empire Mall. Right? Uh, in, in the, the Inland Center Mall, yes. Right, right. Okay. And when I, when I started looking at the newspaper account relative to this woman's death dating back to 1915, I also discovered that there were um, uh, six other kind of questionable, mysterious deaths that had occurred, you know, near or within days or hours of this woman's. And I thought, you know, there's something bigger going on here. And of course, the more I looked into it, the more I indeed found, and I realized, wow, I've got a bona fide, full-fledged um, occult mystery going on here. And that resulted in a, I would say, a two-year investigation with then a year uh, writing the book, you know, bringing all the things together and to get the book out. And uh, that was only the beginning. Um, and as you say, they do really, uh, obviously, the Empire of the Wheel books, there's three of them. They linked together, obviously, because that first book was just, you know, the, the surface. You know, uh, the, the, the deeper I dug, the a lot more did I find. And I think I even, you know, uh, discovered the, the real identity of this mystery woman at the center of all this. And I won't spoil it for anyone who wants to read the books, but that's in the second book, Her True Identity. Well, what was interesting was after I finished, um, or oh, I'm sorry, a, a, as I was investigating, there was some data that had popped up that I'd set aside. So after I finished the trilogy, I went back and revisited this data that had popped up in the Empire of the Wheel investigation, and that led to the Secret Missions book about Juan Cabrillo and his connection to the Inland Empire in Southern California, and what you know that all had to do with him and what was possibly hidden here. And, uh, of course, you know, um, uh, that theme led to the, uh, the second one with Burton. So you, you do point out something that, that is true. The, this work I've done, even though they are different series of books, they do indeed tie in together in many ways. What would I find in chat? I'd forgotten about the, the book that you did on the 33rd, uh, the Disney thing. You actually brought out some interesting things. I learned something. I had no idea that Stanford Research Institute consultants were brought in to help design Disney and to lay out where it was going to be cited. Come on. I mean, look, look. Emily and I both know we've talked about this, this extensively and we've done interviews with tons of people about what's cooking at Stanford Research Institute. And, you know, right. let's face it, we're, we're talking basically a think tank, much like the Rand Institute, uh, on, on an academic level for the military industrial complex. So, I mean, that ties together. And, and I'm kind of building this because as we go into the book we're going to talk about tonight, I don't know if this is an intuition that you follow, if puzzle pieces are just somehow falling into your hands, but in reading your books, one of the experiences that I, I get is that you seem to pick up these little nuggets that everybody else either misses or the connections between the obvious things that people have been looking at. And that's, that's, that's a rare talent in this field because most of this field, the paranormal, the UFO, conspiracy, black ops, and all of that stuff, I find too many people who are basically going for the obvious. And you don't go for the obvious or the easy answers here. Well, what I try to do, um, you know, you got to remember my background is in uh, essentially the intelligence community via specifically counterintelligence and investigations and um, counterespionage operations as well. So, uh, you know, you, you have to um, you have to have kind of an analytical mind 
and um, you got to be able to step back and look at the big picture to do a proper analysis um, because you're always thinking, you're always having to think outside the box when you're hunting a spy, um, which is, you know, or trying to outthink or outsmart a, a, an opposing spy agency, which, which is what I did for most of my career. And so you get used to looking at all the facts and stepping outside that box and looking at everything you have and, and, you know, being able to piece together connections that maybe if you were a little too close, if, uh, particularly if you were inside the box, you were really wouldn't be able to see these connections. Yeah. So I, I, I learned that in that field. And so it was very easy for me to apply it to, it, it really comes naturally to me now. So when I'm looking at these things, um, it, you know, I'll remember, Hey, uh, this little part that, that popped up here, this um, reminds me of something over here, you know, or yeah. over there. And then I'll go over here or over there and I'll find if there indeed is a connection or not. I, I try to be honest as well. Um, I don't, I do not force connections. Um, I, I get frustrated when, you know, sometimes critics will, will just throw that one out there, you know, that I'm forcing conjecture and, and uh, I, I kind of take that personally because I go out of my way to make sure that I'm not forcing any speculations. And certainly, you know, these connections I find, particularly if they're based on a an analysis of, you know, historical things, um, they're there for anybody to find. But uh, after you do this, you know, when you're into anything like this, um, in this case, uh, this Empire of the Wheel mystery, um, seeing these things becomes a lot easier and I don't mean that from the perspective of you're seeing things that aren't there what I mean is you know as you're you're used to looking close and you're used to recognizing you know these connections that are indeed there mm -hmm. um, you know the empire the Disneyland book led me to the empire of the wheel mystery the empire of the wheel mystery um, led to the uh, the Aero Club and the Airship Mystery, legitimately so, and uh, that led me to um, the the well the, the the side stuff led to the secret mission stuff, but the the uh, the the Empire of the Will stuff that led to the Airship Mystery led to the Origin book I did on the Breakaway Civilization about the the airships and the Aero Clubs. And um, I, I try to point out the distinct connections there. But for me, um, it does come kind of naturally at this point. And I would say that anybody with my background and experience level, you know, would probably say the same thing. Yeah, I really, I really like what you do and the way you sort of tie these pieces together. I kind of have a similar process. I don't have uh, a similar kind of background that you, in most ways anyway. But um, that's, I have a really good memory. And so I pick up all the little details and stories. And then exactly as you said, and it's, it's another story, something totally separate from other things or other topics or whatever. There'll be this like little piece that reminds me of the other one. And then I'll go looking. I actually find that in some ways you can string together a more important and cohesive narrative with those little pieces than if you go for the big obvious ones. I think a lot of times, obviously, you know this, the big obvious ones are distractions or the, you know, this is what the left hand is doing. Don't look what the right hand is doing. I actually find that the deeper, more meaningful connections is with those little breadcrumbs. Yeah, sure. And, and like you said, you know, you, you come at this skill, um, this approach from your own background. And like, for me, for me, it just happened to be what I used to do. But like, like you come from a different background, there might be someone out there that comes from a completely other professional background, but the skill set is the same, see? And, um, you know, somebody who's uh, a, a sports journalist could have the same skill set. It's, it's the analytical mind. And, and I think you'll agree, uh, you know, if you exercise it, it's like a muscle if you exercise it, you just get naturally um, better at it so that, you know, it, it's, it's, it comes more quickly. Absolutely. You know? and Absolutely. It, yeah. it does help you put the big picture together and give you perspective on what really might be going on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I'll put up. That's it. Go ahead, Randy. Well, what I was going to say is what I found uh, useful in this field, uh, interviewing people, such as yourself and talking between people like Emily and myself, 
there's a wide range of experience here. I mean, I come from a background in, in um, information technology. I'm an analyst from a data set standpoint. So I'm always looking at all of the things that a database does, which is oh. basically aggregating, separating, combining, you know, all of the all of the data kind of streams through to me in like a, in, in a tabular sense. But then there comes that point where you throw all the pieces out on the floor and you run some wild out assed algorithm and you come up with some unexpected picture. I mean, good analysts spot anomalies, which is exactly what we're talking about in yep. this in this over that you, that you that you've woven going back even to the Disney book. What's interesting to me is the airships, the breakaway civilization, the the mystery of the Nimza, and we can we can touch on what that is, all come to rest in this narrative of the shimmering light, which actually comes back to you personally through your father and his experiences in 1958. Yes, and that is... <laughs> uh, I actually find that poetic in a way. Yeah, it's either astonishing or just completely unbelievable, depending <laughs> upon your perspective, right? Or it's exactly what happened, right? <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, no, I, I, I find the same thing. I find, you know, when I'm putting together pieces of my background, I, it's uncanny how whatever I'm looking into, which would seemingly have nothing to do with anything in my background, I will find something in my background that connects to it. And it's almost like we're being, like we're magnetized to find this, like magnetized to, to figure this out. Like all, you know, all stories somehow relate to our personal story. And, and it's very interesting. <laughs> There you go. When you start looking at the numerology of, and, and synchronicities of your personal life, um, you can be amazed at how much you didn't see was connected actually makes sense and indeed was connected. Now, um, the danger in that is, uh, you know, it can drive some people mad. Um, it, it can really cause uh, some problems and it's really, it's not for anyone. But um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. It's there. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, yeah, we deal with people. And if you're not familiar with what we do, I started this show back in 2009 as an inquiry into specifically the UFO phenomena based on my own experiences uh, as a child and later, and also into MK ultra and black operations. Again, because of things I perceived as hints and clues in my own life. And um, over the years, and with Emily joining me, we have interviewed a pretty wide array of people, many of whom have gone through incredible trauma, memory recovery, um, coming to grips with the dark side of, of what all of this is. So uh, when, when, I, when I was looking at, at your book, Shimmering Light, which, you know, the full title of this is Shimmering Light Lost in an MK Ultra House of Anu. There's like three buttons I can punch right now. We'll start with Shimmering Light, which is cop from the Eagles Hotel, California. I saw Shimmering Light. The, the whole image of that sitting in the desert with the shimmering light and the the, you know, whatever hypnotic experience is going on. I mean, I've always suspected that Don Henley and Glenn Fry, the Eagles, are kind of, well, let's just say project kids in some way. So I think they're actually capturing imagery there. But as we go through tonight's show, I want to I wanna focus it down a little bit on what your father was trying to communicate to you apparently over a very long period of time. Can you just kind of nugget that as a way for us to kind of depart out into the wider array of sure. the book? Mm -hmm. um, it, it, I think that what he was trying to do was simply um, uh, share this extraordinary thing that had happened to him in a very basic human level. You know, this, this very strange and big thing that was there in his mind, it, he just had to get it out. And when obviously, you know, one of his three kids um, was the most interested, you know, that's the one that he was going to try to relate this to. And then also, you know, as the book says, um, some years later, 
I started drawing, you know, it out of him. I, I started getting him to talk about it uh, more often because of my interest and because of the reasons um, that are laid, you know, that I go into in the book that are laid out in the book uh, being essentially instructed to do this as well. Um, yeah, I, I think it was that basic human need to share the experience with the, um, someone you're close to. Because I did reach a point where I was uh, learning more about what he was telling me than he was telling me. And I was learning this from another source, of course. Randy, we can't hear you. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, no, that was me. I muted out. What, what in your recollection was the earliest you recall him communicating things that felt, I guess, out of place, disjointed in some way? People who are communicating from a place of trauma or disassociation usually project things out there in, in interesting ways. They're not, they're not always overt about it. But they're dropping clues. I mean, I, I've seen this consistently with people who are experiencers in, in many, many realms, that they drop clues. Do you, is that what you remember about your father, uh, dropping clues, kind of alerting you that, yeah, there was some stuff going on? Uh, do, you, do you mean in... Are, are, are you asking me when did... Uh, oh. At yeah, what when point did you have recollection? When did you when did you like get the sense that oh shit, there's really you know there's something going on here? Oh well, he started just telling the story. He first uh -huh. just told you know um, uh, started talking about it during uh, around 1974. I remember I, I seem to recall that it was 1974 and we were talking about UFOs, and that was the first time he started talking about the idea that hey. You know, there's other people out there, and there was something that crashed in New Mexico, you know, in the late 40s. It, it wasn't that he had said something, and and I said, hey, what's that? What does he mean? It, he just started telling the story, and um, it, was, it was consistent for years. And I... Um, the only time I, the only reason I had to question whether the story he told was true or not was because of the history. I, I didn't really start um, looking at it as a planted narrative seriously until I started doing the book. Um, because you recall, you know, from the book, my source on this um, was telling me that this really happened, what he was telling me. So I had good reason to accept what he was telling me was a true story. Now, um, in the interest of being, you know, totally uh, honest as a writer and as a researcher, as a journalist, so to speak, on this, an investigator, um, I, you know, I felt I was obligated to point out all the MK Ultra type of stuff going on around this time and the fact that I was also told by this source that they did indeed use um, hypnosis to suppress what happened to it. Well, you know, the fact that I was told that hypnosis was used and, you know, we know that hypnosis was a major part of MK Ultra, and um, all the other factors involved, which the book goes into, um, you know, uh, that was when I began to realize, okay, perhaps the, the wild aspects of the story are indeed part of a planted narrative and you know maybe my source was trying to get me to root out the nugget you know the 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 actual um source truth that this planted narrative w was layering in camouflage so yeah okay so the the earliest narrative triangulates between um Wright Patterson Air Force ba Base in Dayton, and then a base location in Texas and a location in Arizona. Am I correct? Did I get that narrative? Did I get that correct? Well, uh, no, he was at a base in Alabama, Gunner okay, Air Force Alabama. Base. Alabama. Got yeah. it. And, and then he goes to Wright Patterson, and then he claimed to be in an, 
underground operation in Arizona. Okay. So his designated um, specialty at that time had to do with flight testing, uh, specifically flight uh, related to uh, uh, flight flight uh, medicine, I guess, would be one way to put it. In other words, he was doing his, testing. His specialty was uh, physiological training okay. specialist. Okay. And uh, this fell under U.S. Air Force Aviation Medicine. Right. Um, basically, he, his, his regular mundane duty was to run pilots through the altitude chamber. Okay. And but to also do um, maintenance on and ground testing on uh, pressure suits and oxygen delivery systems of the day. And his unit at George Air Force Base had been involved in uh, the classified testings of the Mercury spacesuits because the Mercury program was originally a U.S. Air Force program um, uh, before NASA was founded took over the program. Yeah, a lot of people don't know that now. In fact, I, it was a reminder to me. I knew that, but it had been a long time since I had considered that our actual space program went back that far. Um, so... That particular specialty of his kind of leads us down the first kind of murky shadows, which was, it appears as well in the narrative of the book that he is also working in what I guess most of us would call some kind of crash retrieval. How does that fit into the narrative? Well, that was a really interesting discovery I had made um, in the last year when digging through um, some of his old papers. I, I put in a request which still has not been answered by the DOD for his, his full personnel records file, but I do have a copy of his DD-214, and with mm -hmm. that, I discovered, was a small form, the GAFB for George Air Force Base Form 101. Mm -hmm. um, this was something that he would have carried on his person, and uh, it described exactly what his uh, duty title was and, and what the responsibility of the you know, job description was. But also, typed onto this form was uh, an identifier that he was on a casualty collection team number one. And you can imagine uh, where my mind went with all the stories we've had over the last decade about UFO crash retrieval, you know, such. And here my dad was on, in 1958, a casualty collection team. Now, of course, this has to do with, you know, aircraft crashes and recovering technology and, and tragically the bodies of the pilots, the remains sure. of the pilots. Of course. And he even told me about that. Mm -hmm. But when you think about the fact that he had a very high clearance and he worked in the space program and, you know, the early days of Mercury for the Air Force and what he did. And when you add to that the story that he told me where he was briefed in on the Roswell crash and he was told that it had happened again and was sent to Arizona in 1958 to be part of another search and rescue operation, it kind of brings another dimension to this actual casualty collection team number one, that he was assigned to. So what I have is documented evidence that he was involved in this kind of duty. And then I've got his story. And then, of course, we have this milieu of, you know, legend about alien or, or, or you know, UFO crashes. It really just kind of gives it, you know, uh, uh, gravitas. Uh, so to um, you know, in considering his story. And these documents, by the way, are in the book, of course. They're in the back of the book. Mm -hmm. People can see them. Now, you mentioned Roswell, so let's go there. Roswell has become this mother load of ufology lure that has... I, 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 I've interviewed a number of people, including several researchers who talk about the 
evidence that was removed from the scene at Roswell and transported to Wright-Patterson. I have no problem with that. I've been to Wright-Patterson. My brother was a, was a flight surgeon in the U.S. Air Force stationed at wright Pat. So I've been out to date and I've been around the base. You know, I, I even said in one show, you know, I just found Dayton, Ohio to be an incredibly creepy place, much like some of the places that I visited out in the desert in, in Arizona. There's this ominous really? hum to it. I, yeah. I, I love the area. It was three it's of the beautiful. best years of I was assigned there. <laughs> I think it was an outsider, though, and maybe even colored by what I already knew about it. I just had a sense that it was, it felt like a very closed community. It felt like it was very military. And there was just, I don't know, um, intuition can be funny and sometimes it can be misleading. I felt the place had kind of an edge to it. But it is a beautiful place and it is a very nice town. So, we have pretty much an agreement that whatever was picked up off the ground at Roswell, including the alleged, quote, alien bodies, somehow made its way to um, storage facilities at Wright-Patterson Air Base. Um, but the nature of all of this, what actually happened at Roswell has been so, it, it, it's been a feeding frenzy now for for so long, and so many people have just rehashed the same stories. What I find interesting is, and, you, and i got to tell the listeners, I watched you posting on Facebook when you were writing this book. It's one of the reasons why I really wanted to do this interview. You, you basically announced, look, there's going to be a lot of speculation with this, which I find yeah. marvelously refreshing because everybody wants to close the loop on this stuff. Right. But, right. Um, um, you know, here's the thing. We don't know enough um, publicly to be able to close the loop on it. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that you appreciate speculation because, uh, you know, I do that in all of my books. Um, you know, you're kind of forced to. And, and I honestly identify when I'm doing it. Um, but, uh, yes, you're right about the Roswell situation. Uh, it, what has dominated Roswell research, Roswell literature, Roswell media has been the assumption of the ET hypothesis. Right. And there is so little true evidence to support the ET hypothesis, but so much more evidence to support the various alternative theories that um, it really comes down to um, it has been for 25 or 30 years or more just a stubborn insistence by the ET uh, hypothesis folks. And I think with the, in recent years, really, with um, the, the, the implosion, the crumbling of the whole Roswell milieu, and I'm speaking of, you know, the witnesses that, you know, were, were yeah. proven to be mixed up or, you know, how could they really remember all this stuff? Or even some witnesses that were just flat out lying and, you know, you know, some of the, the, the good researchers like, like Kevin Randall, you know, finally, you know, realizing, you know, that, hey, even he had been told false stuff or wrong stuff and that we're, we're kind of back to square one. I think now um, we can approach Roswell uh, in, in a fresh way and consider these other options that have just been pushed aside and dismissed for too long. And, um, you know, this, I, I felt like it was important to throw my hat in the ring on this. Um, and I also point out, you know, some of the others, particularly uh, Joseph Farrell. Yes. You know, his yeah. Who really pisses most of these people off on a regular basis because of what he thinks about the connections to the Nazi bell and, um, you know, the fact that we may not be dealing with extraterrestrials at all, but advanced flight technology. Well, I just want to say something really fast. Uh, and your point about the UFO people and the alien people, uh, basically they have been sucking air out of this room on a number of topics, the MKUltra topic, the um, advanced technology topic, the break breakaway civilization kind of topic, and also parallel uh, worlds or parallel civil civilization topic. They really do um, color all of those things. And I think once you clear that 
from your mind. Once you deprogram that, then you can get into the real meat and potatoes of all these other programs and realities. So that was a very good point. Yeah. Oh, well, and, and here's the thing. I'm not saying that I don't think there's ETs. Of course no. I think there are. Yes. Right, exactly. I mean, yeah, yeah. We all agree I, on that. There were, I think there were ancient astronauts. I think, I think there's validity there. Um, I, I think we're continuing to be, uh, you know, visited by ETs. My beef, my point really that I try to make with people is it does not explain everything and it does not explain nearly as much as the folks that are proponents of that to that extent would, would have you believe. Um, right. and, and, you know, a lot, of, a lot of that's done out of enthusiasm. They're not trying to be nefarious, you know, um, or but lead a people. Of, a lot of them are very naive and their, their answers for things keep, people who are who should be held responsible for some of these situations from being held responsible right yeah the other other side of this is and this goes back again to this book is by focusing this much on only the et hypothesis we have missed so many other possibilities which you unfold and which we're going to toss out in little bits here in the course of this interview related to some other possibilities, including the fact that, A, it may be a breakaway civilization, it may be a civilization that has been with us for a long time, that has been hidden from us. These possibilities need to be explored. So go ahead and unpack some of that, Walter, because that, that is the interesting stuff that I want to get into with you. Okay, well... Here's the thing. Um, as you know, the book gets into um, the, this this parallel uh, civilization, and I don't mean the breakaway. I mean the parallel civilization, like you said, that appears to have been with us for a very long time. This by no means is original with me. Um, what I have always been intrigued with and what I find um, curiously pushed aside and generally ignored is what Jacques Vallée himself concluded, you know, 30 years ago in that, hey, um, there appears to be this race of beings that's been with us a long time and they're not extraterrestrials. Um, They're certainly not little greys. And that's who he thought. And my understanding from a friend who, you know, has had interaction with him very recently, what he still, what he still, you know, thinks is valid and um, it, 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 it always intrigued me, but like I said, I'm curious, you know, it, it gets pushed aside because it's not convenient. It's um, not what they want to hear. It's not what they want to promote. But that, um, that parallel civilization um, is found through the prism of our mythology and folklore. And uh, it, it's to be found in particularly... Celtic fairy lore. Exactly. Now I know people are going to say, and they're going to say, "Oh, fairies!" You know, um, when you get into that lore, you realize or you learn really fast that you're not talking about Tinkerbell from the Disney movie. You know, you're not <laughs> talking about these little hot Coddington uh, sprites. You know, that are the size of butterflies. No, but you're funny how about- funny how Disney has a corner of the market on the on how we think of uh, fairies as well. <laughs> Right. Sure, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, <laughs> one way or another, by default or not. Um, but uh, uh, but but as Jacques Vallée, you know, pointed out a few decades ago, when you look at the UFO reports, whereas on the one hand you could say, "Oh, see, that's extraterrestrial." Actually, these reports um, are identical in in many ways to the old accounts of these this hidden race of of you know the that, that was the nugget of truth that became our fairy lore of, of mythology. Now, some people would immediately argue, and they do, I've heard this, we've all heard it, that, oh, well, see, what people were calling the fairies and, and the other ones, um, those, see, those were extraterrestrials, and they didn't know how else to describe them. And no, that's not what Valet is saying, and that's not what the lore says, and that's not what an honest, an honest uh, analysis and examination of this uh, concludes. Um, that's just a rationalization for not accepting that we might be talking about interdimensionals 
ultra terrestrials, so to speak. Um, and for me, that is just so much more infinitely um, uh, fascinating because it does match what has been reported and what appears to be going on and, and is and is more interesting than little grays from another planet. Yeah. yeah. So you refer to these in, in the book, and, and it's not your terminology. This is actually part of the established literature. To author the Don, Donan, um, which is also known as the, the fairies or the fae. Um, mm -hmm. And you point out some very interesting aspects of the, of the lure of, of this race that goes into the arc of what we would call UFO encounters, ET abduction, um, mainly having to do with the exotic technology, flying machines, and interestingly enough, this ability to do brain wipes on people. Um, fill in, if you can, some of the, there's a, there's a whole narrative here inside of the book that has to do with the clues that you found that led you to believe that the mission that your father went on was an encounter with what you speculate you believe may have happened, which would, which would be with this particular group called the Tuatha de Danan. Yeah, so or, or I, I have to tell you, all these years I've been reading about them, I, I first read about them in Valet decades ago, I still don't think I can pronounce that right. Um, uh, Tawatha de Danan. I'm, not sure is, I, I'm just, yep. Uh, I like to, that. To Bannon, um, uh, you, know, you name it, however we, uh, however we can pronounce it. However we can pronounce it, I, I don't know, but essentially um, the, the way to Danans, um, they, uh, many ages ago, uh, they, they eventually went underground. So, you know, they're connected with an underground world. Um, in, the, in the fairy lore, you have, you know, these beings um, in the underground world or, or otherwise who carry um, what, what is, you know, uh, in some cases called a rod. In some cases, in my dad's case, this, this being had a tube. But they, uh, they carry this thing in their hand that can uh, serve as a weapon. It can serve as, as many things, but, but what it will do is it will paralyze, you know, the witness or the victim, whatever the case may be. And, um, you know, my dad, he says his story happened in the underworld. Um, he encounters this being with this uh, tube that kills a man that is pointed at. Um, you know, those were big clues, the fact that it was underground. There was also the fact that, you know, he was told that this was a civilization that had gone underground thousands of years ago. Well, the Tueda Danans had gone underground thousands of years ago. So there was, there was all this overt, or, you know, or, or these, I would say, the, these three key overt pieces to this. And it just struck me as, you know, I think he is having more of an encounter with this underground lost civilization than anything, you know, extraterrestrial. In fact, he said all along that this was not an extraterrestrial civilization that had crashed at either Roswell or in Arizona in 1958. He insisted on that. And, and of course, as you know, I, I say that in the book. So there he is insisting that it was a, an, a, a hidden civilization here on earth that they were underground, the, the bit with the, the rod or the tube, um, you, you know, it, it's just the connections there, the parallels are obvious. And when you're reading this stuff in uh, Valet's research and also in uh, Bruce Ruck's, in, in his stuff, um, you know, it, it, it kind of forces you to consider that, okay, maybe it is these other people. You know, there's there's less extraterrestrial going on here than we've been led to assume. Now, given your work in um, kind of going through Sir Richard 
Burden's work, which goes into the South American cultures and the underground cities there and the things that um, David Childress was bringing out. Are, do you get the sense, we, we, we have these enduring legends of underground cities, cities made of gold, um, people who live underground, uh, Jules Verne even hints to it in Journey to the Center of the Earth, you know, sort of a, 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 a earlier time pulp novel, but, but we, we, we have these enduring legends and it seems like what came in, and I'll just use 1947 and Roswell as kind of the place to mark this. It's what I call the modern age of ufology. It's like ufology itself sort of stepped into the void that had been um, left by our Oh, the 20th century was largely us becoming literate, technical, a scientific society, far more um, prone to logic and reason and more dismissive of lure and folk tales and things that had emerged, I think, maybe out of the collective subconscious. So these things kind of linger in the background, but they don't inform or narrative in modern times. So in a sense, what I kind of see you doing is you're excavating the, the, the human collective unconscious to kind of bring this back up to the surface to let people look at this as, as something we've ignored. Is that kind of a fair assessment? Well, I, I would say what I'm doing is pointing to um, that that has been done by... Um, other researchers who did it in greater depth than I did and um, who, who, you know, done it before me. But what I'm saying is, is that what they, you know, specifically with Jacques Vallée, of course, mm -hmm. um, pointed out in his work fits this experience. Like you said, it, it fits the uh, circumstances. It fits the details my dad, you know, shared and the, it fits the circumstances and the situation surrounding my dad's experience. So what, what I'm trying to do is point out that, Hey, I'm not the only guy who, you know, thinks there's something to this, you know, look at this guy who is, um, in all other accounts, highly respected by ufology. Yeah. And yet it seems like they've kind of pushed aside what his conclusion about this was. <laughs> and what I'm saying is, is it can't be pushed aside anymore. Um, it, it it has to be considered, and it's kind of a uh, in in a way, it's kind of a new animal to marry this up with the ufology. You bring up a good point because yes, it might be that um, our technology and our understanding um, w had finally caught up with what this hidden civilization had known for ages. Um, and uh, you know, so uh, what seemed like magic, we were beginning to understand and what, uh, you know, they were able to do was just simply a little bit more um, advanced than we were at the time. And maybe they're just a little bit ahead of us, um, you know, still, but we're, we're beginning to grasp the idea that what they do, what they have, what they possess and use is indeed just a technology. So there's, with all these things that you've just said, there's so many things I could pull at. But for some reason, what I keep going to is this sort of mirrors this whole thing that I think people are having to deal with right now is people are really obsessed with like space and UFOs and looking outside of themselves for answers instead of looking inside of themselves. And we've been looking out there too long when maybe the answers are within our earth. Like all of these things that we've been mystified by, you know, we, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, when we're looking outside of ourselves for answers. Like this is, where, whatever this is, the earth, whatever shape it is, wherever the fuck, excuse me, wherever we are, like the answers yeah. are all here inside. And, you know, something has been trying to get us to look outside of ourselves and outside of the planet for, for, the, for the answers to the things that are, seem mysterious to us. So I thought about that, but I also thought, and this is funny because this is the last thing I ex expected talking to you rem to remind me of. But when you're talking about the fairies and you're talking about these experiences, the things with the technology, it makes me think of when Ten Terrence McKenna describes DMT experience. And there's lots of problems with Terrence McKenna, but if there wasn't some truth to some of the things he said, it wouldn't, 
it wouldn't have, you know, he wouldn't have been useful to them and, and, and it wouldn't have resonated with people. When he talks about coming across self-transforming machine elves who showed him things that he who would show you things that you almost couldn't believe and, you know, almost magical things. And you'd have this experience yeah. that seemed like, what, like amazing. It, it, you had to stop yourself from falling lured by the wonder of it. Right. But then after the DMT experience was over almost immediately, you couldn't remember what you had, what you had just witnessed. That sounds a lot like this memory wipes, you know what I mean? And the other thing is, it also reminded me with this thing with the tube that caused paralysis of sleep paralysis, which is something that I've suffered from my whole life. Yeah. And then yeah. often, it's often part of some kind of screen to keep me from a memory of what was happening to me during that time. So sure. it's one of all these things. What do you think about that? Well, I, I, you know, it appears when you, you look at the lore and the stories, and then you look at the recent accounts, um, it, it appears that they indeed possess this very uh, this very knowledge, this very skill, uh, technology to do this. Um, and I think what it does is um, it, 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 again, kind of forces us to take a look at um, these old stories again from, you know, the fresh, uh, uh, an, an attempt at an objective perspective, um, you know, to, to say, okay, could it be ET? Yes, it could be, but we've got to stop assuming that it necessarily is. Yeah, I'm almost thinking at this moment that this technology is somehow that you're able to do something that stimulates your body to create dimethyltryptamine because it's a natural thing that occurs inside sure. your body, which then makes you have this almost awe-inspiring experience and then you can not, not be able to remember it. So what could that you think that could be possibly part of the technology is they have a way of getting the person who whatever that they come across to stimulate DMT production in their body? Sure, I don't see why not. I mean, we can do things to, yeah. to you know, manipulate our physiology. So yeah. why not? Yeah. Why not? It, does, it doesn't have to be, um, you know, the other the other issue that I have a lot of times with the, with the ET hypothesis is that, um, well, we couldn't possibly do the things that people are seeing, so therefore it must come from another world. Right. Okay. Right. I'm sorry, but that's um, quite presumptive. And yeah. that, that, that assumption to me is just as ridiculous as the assumption that a civilization that figures out interstellar travel must necessarily have uh, conquered their bellicose nature and they know. Thank you. Yes. Thank I, you. Yeah. I, I, we I need laugh to... my ass with that one every time. Yeah. <laughs> um, no. I, it's a ridiculous thing that these, these star travelers are these peaceful space brothers that are, you know, have come to rise us to this, next great level because they're so wonderful. I, I think that's a load of horse crap. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Because if that were kind of the case, then you'd think of people like um, George Soros and Bill Gates that they've, they've become so successful and they have all this stuff. Why would they be concerned with controlling the peons? Right. So that logic would have to go for that too. So that makes no sense. Yeah, exactly. You know, whenever you have somebody telling you that, you know, someone's here to, you know, to be the peaceful space brother that's going to solve all your problems, you need to be suspicious. Yeah, for sure. Well, the, the theory is, the prevalent theory has been that theoretically these civilizations that have survived their own technology. Uh, the, with, with, you know, the corollary to that being that humanity, having possessed nuclear physics, is not yet demonstrated reasonable maturity and therefore we're still warlike because of that, rather than looking at the fact that most of this technology has not changed the nature of who we are. It hasn't changed our consciousness towards any kind of peaceful civilization. We're, we're warlike. There are other warlike civilizations out there just by preponderance of numbers. Well, who's to say that... Uh... <laughs> And, and here's an essential problem I have with, uh, you know, our, our, our world today. Um, you know, the idea that any war at any time whatsoever is wrong, wrong, wrong. Um, I disagree with that. Now, here's the thing. Everything in moderation. Sometimes, folks, it's necessary to go to war. Now, we could say that in our times there are too many wars. Well, yeah, that's true because that's no longer moderation, correct? Um, but sometimes it is necessary. So to me, the, 
the warlike aspect of you know the nature of intelligent beings i don't see it as something to be overcome this is this is a fantasy and a wet dream that's you know in in our 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 literature and in our movies and our books and things like that it's it's all nice you know it's it's utopianist uh thinking and um i uh, i reject utopian thinking i think it's foolish it's childish it's not realistic um you know so i don't necessarily um assume that uh because for instance um you know, you develop a certain type of technology and, and it's a sign of some type of spiritual immaturity. Um, you know, uh, that, that's, that's my position. And when you, when you look at things that way, it, it also helps you, I think, remain realistic about who might be coming to this planet. Um, there's no way that all these star travelers are so spiritualistically mature that they're all just peace loving, you know, wonderful guys. Uh, no way. Yeah, absolutely not. <laughs> I guess it kind of even begs the question, why did these, why did this other civilization go into the earth in the first place? And it appears as though they possess weapons. They possess technology that must have some martial aspects to it so um we're not even dealing here with like these peaceful little trolls like hobbits in middle earth we're dealing with civilization that appears to have serious capabilities defensively well and remember you know when you're familiar with the material they weren't invincible they were the the two a denan were defeated when you look at the lore, they were defeated and uh, they, they went underground. Now, uh, according to the other lore, there was a, a cataclysm on the surface of the earth, a very natural cataclysm, and that drove um, a hidden civilization, but, or that drove human beings inside the earth into the subterranean world, and, and the story goes that some of them developed this civilization that remained down there and yeah. chooses to be hidden, and uh, it, it's parallel to our own, but even though they might have a different technology that appears as magic to us, even though um, they might be able to do things that we apparently can't, um, I would say that they're just a little bit ahead of us in some respects, yeah. but they're not invincible and they're not, you know, um, all knowing. They're just parallel. They're just a different group of folks. Yeah. So as we, I'm, I'm, did you want to say something then? No, go ahead. I was going to say that that sounds, that sounds right to me. As, yeah. as we kind of round out this segment, um, the other component to this, the breakaway civilization, um, where do you see that, if it does at all, fitting into, you know, the narrative of Shimmering Light? Ah, well, um, here's how I see it. You're asking me my perspective, being yes. the guy who wrote the books I wrote, and uh, those familiar with my milieu will understand this even more clear, you know, like yourself, uh, clearly. Um, I see that the breakaway that has been labeled the NIMSA, um, I think that they had some contact with, some exposure to um, some hidden ones, some some past ancient visitors to this world. Um, I, I, what I really have to go back to is um, the, the subtitle references the House of Anu. Yes. Now the two eight and um, they are that that is you know the term for the children of Anu. Now some folks have asked me, oh that that must be the Anunnaki, right? I'm like, no. Um, in my opinion, no. The the two eight and N are not the Anunnaki. Um, I think they and the Anunnaki were in opposition to each other. I associate the Anunnaki with the Nimza, the ancient concept of Nimza that I talk about in two or three of my books that you'll be familiar with. And yes. I think that the, the Prussian, the German Nimza uh, mm. was uh, basically learned what they knew um, from them 
and uh, basically are, are allied, associated with the Anunnaki, okay? And the other breakaway civilization that I um, theorized, the 1903, I call them, the, um, the American yes. group, yep. um, they... They may have some type of uh, contact with the Tue Danaean. Um, I haven't, you know, really jumped in on that to explore any connection like that. But I would say, if if I just had to speculate and throw it out there, I would say you could probably find the uh, Tue Danaeans um, uh, associating with the 1903 um, in opposition to the German Nimza. Um, and their association to the Anunnaki. Wow. So, see, folks, now you've got a lot of reading to do because you've got to go back and read Empire of the Wheel trilogy plus, you know, the rest of these books to piece this together from our guest, Walter Bosley's perspective. Um, we're just wetting the appetite here. This isn't, this isn't the full course dinner. Um, we're, not gonna, we're not closing loops or, or, or squaring anything. Just saying, this is what we're tossing out. That's going to end it for segment one of the show. We're going to take a brief break. We'll have a musical interlude. Come back on the other side, and uh, I've got a couple more, and Emily has a couple more topics that we want to unpack with you, Walter, in terms of of the book. Uh, Mainly, uh, I want to go into MKUltra and... um, some of the background of your father's own experiences with, I guess, what we would call Operation Paperclip. So we'll, we'll do that in the second segment, and we'll be back.
This is Off Planet Radio. We're back. This is Off Planet Radio, Off t- Planet TV, kind of a hybrid. We never know if it's video, it's audio. We we'll throw some pictures. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the website is offplanetradio.com. I'm Randy Moggins with my co host, Emily Moyer. And uh, what has turned out to be kind of a really fun, loose, as it usually is and should be, uh, conversation with our guest, Walter Bosley, who's with us from Southern California. We're talking about the book, uh, Shimmering Light Lost in an MK Ultra House of Anu. And uh, Walter, I'm going to let you give out the websites. I know you've got a couple. I know that um, your a website for your nonfiction work is. I was just looking for it here, and I lost it on the scroller. So go ahead, jump in, and save me for myself here. Okay, my uh, nonfiction website is empireofthewheel dot. I'm sorry. Let me start over. Empire of the Wheel dot blogspot dot com yes and uh my books can be found at amazon on kindle and for printed editions they can be found at lulu l-u-l-u dot com uh shimmering light is not yet available as we're recording this but i hope to have it up and available by the first of uh, the year Excellent. The Kindle is presently available, but the printed edition is not yet available. Yeah, that almost begs me to ask a question completely off topic. Well, I know Joseph Farrell's take on Kindle. He's not happy about it. It breaks his formatting. It breaks his meticulous work at, at, at flow and continuity. How do you feel about Kindle in general as a publishing platform? It doesn't bother me at all. Okay. Um, I do. I do understand they do their own pagination. Yep. The page numbers between, you know, my original file and, and what is identical to the printed file, um, they're, they're different. They're paginated differently on Kindle. You know, if I have a 200, like I just published a, a, a novel that's like 180 pages that came out to 107 pages on Kindle. That doesn't bother me. As long as my date, what I'm saying is there, um, I'm fine with it. Uh, I find it very easy. Um, I've had my publishing company since 2002, and, and quite frankly, um, I went all digital in 2010. I used to be a traditional publisher. I used to put out thousands mm-hmm. of dollars out to print books ahead of time before they were sold and such. Um, I had to go all digital in 2010, or I wouldn't have been able to stay in business. Um, I sell easily 100 or more copies to one of uh, digital to printed. So I I find that a lot more people are are buying my books on Kindle than they have ever on the uh, print on demand, you know, printed editions. In spite of what people say, you know, you always hear people say I prefer that physical book. But like I said, I sell a hundred or more to one digital to printed. So I'm very happy with um, being, you know, with yeah. putting books out on. It's funny because I pulled Empire of the Wheel down off the shelf. It's a good uh, people don't I don't have it here right now, but it's kind of a large format book. But I was flipping through it just to grab some touchstones for the interview, and then flipping back and forth on Kindle reading, um, you know, Shimmering Light, and you know, I'm, I'm as a researcher, the Kindle is a godsend because. Uh, I annotate as I go. I can bookmark, I can annotate, I can put these little, uh, you know, my own comments into it. So it's great for me, plus the fact that, you know, I've had to tell book publishers, please don't send me hard copy anymore if you can send me digital because I just don't have room to store the books. I mean, (laughs) my library... So many others, you know, they they ask me for the printed and that takes me longer to get it to them. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. We live in the age of... Uh, of digital and I'm comfortable. I just wondered how you felt about it as both a publisher and an author and whether you yeah, I like the digital I, at all I, I, I like, I like. It sounds like you have one of the uh, original editions of the first Empire of the Wheel book I have seen. I do. I actually have a, uh, a pre-publication edition of it. That I don't know how I got the damn thing now. I uh, I have since reformatted that first Empire of the Wheel book, and now it is the same dimensions as the other two. It's five and a half by eight and a half, or perhaps it's six by nine. I guess yeah, six by nine. I'm sorry. So um, it 
it, it, it fits on the shelf with the other two, <laughs> the, the, the current print, and print on demand edition. So one more time, give out your website so we didn't derail anybody. They want to know where the website is for your nonfiction work. It is empireofthewheel.blogspot.com. Cool. And um, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter. Um, my social media is not a constant stream of stuff from the books, but I can be contacted there. Um, and, you know, people are welcome to, to look for me there as well. Excellent. So we're going to start off this segment. We're going to kind of go into the MK Ultra side of this because it actually is the deep murky side to me and I think to Emily as well. When we were talking on the break, uh, Emily and I, um, about the fact that we have what appears to be this breakaway civilization that's being funded on the backs of the taxpayers of the United States through programs. And this goes into uh, the revelations that Catherine Austin Fitz, among others, have put out um, about the billions of dollars that have been uh, sort of exchequered out of the out of the, the standard operating budgets of agencies like like HUD. What is your sense of well, we have right now on the internet we have wild speculation about secret space programs and breakaway space um, colonies and people going to Mars and people going to the moon, um, but what if the real breakaway civilization m might actually be here on this planet? What's your sense of that in terms of how all of this may function together as, as some kind of narrative or informing the narrative? Well, my perspective, based on my personal analysis and point of view of all this, um, is that what is being funded in the black budget you know, as you say, the taxpayer dollars, is probably our secret space program. Okay. Well, the breakaway civilization that people often refer to, which I have identified as being NIMSA associated, um, that is the one that people, the one that's the most popular concept. Um, I have identified that with a, a NIMSA association. They have their own resources, in my opinion. Um, they, they're not doing everything they do on the back taxpayer. Um, they have resources off planet, mining, whatever they have. They have their own banks, you know, various international banks that they've had control of for a long time. Um, but what the U.S. taxpayer, uh, when you look at the very good evidence and, and the numbers like Catherine Austin Fitz points to is um, is the secret financing, the, the black financing of a secret space program. Now, I'm all for us having a secret space program. I discuss in my book and I've discussed elsewhere that I think we've had it, you know, uh, a secret space program since the, practically since the U.S. Air Force was created out of the um, Army Air Corps. In the in the late forties, going into the fifties. Yes. And so, in my personal view, my personal opinion is I'm all for our Department of Defense, specifically our Air Force, having a secret space program. Because you know, remember, I'm an Air Force officer. I'm reserve officer, inactive, but I'm an Air Force officer. Um, I understand why things are classified. I understand how people can can say, you know, this looks all, you know, nefarious and it, it can't be good. It can't be good um, because you can't really talk about it. So you kind of got to let people's imaginations get away with them to some degree. Um, and that's just kind of, you know, the temporary price you pay before that day comes when those same citizens are thanking their lucky stars that we have that secret space program when the day comes that we have to use it and it saves our butts. Um, so that's my personal view on it. I have no problem with there being a black budget. I have no problem with there being a secret space program. I hope to God, you know, we do have one and, and yeah, I think we do. Okay. So I, I guess what, what, what I was going at, the, the, something Randy, you had something in the notes about 
HUD, offices like HUD or departments like HUD being sort of a front or a cover for where this budget stuff was going. And I just synchronistically. Oh, well, yeah, there's, there's the evidence that it, it was, you know, that's channeled through several sure. agencies. And I point out in the book that uh, uh, Richard Souter. Yeah, that's, uh, where I was, that's where I was about yeah. to go. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, mean, that's, I, yeah, I, I, no, I agree with you. But I, I just thought what, what was funny is just today on the way home to do this interview, I was listening to uh, something that came out today. Sean from SGT was interviewing Richard Souter. And he was talking about a woman he knew that had worked for the department of the, for HUD. And in the '90s, she recounted to him a story of the Secret Service coming to her with some at her office at HUD with some documents, escorting her to the White House and having her deliver the the first time just deliver these documents basically to the circus, Secret Service that was working at the gate and then leaving. Yeah. She understood why that happened, and then the second time it happened, they actually let her into the White House, and she went down into some underground to sit to 17 floors and uh-huh. walked into a corridor that she couldn't see where it possibly ended. It looked so long. She right. went into something there, handed this to somebody behind the desk, left, and never heard anything else about that. So I was just going to yeah. say, yeah, I mean, that puts yeah, me... I'm very intrigued with that when I read it in his book, and, uh, you know, I allude to it in, in my book, because, you know, how about that? Isn't that interesting, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> why, why would HUD, you know, uh, be involved in, you know, what are these documents that had to be treated this way? And, and there, that's the question Souter asks. That's yeah. what and that I repeat. And uh, you know, it's definitely food for thought, you know. And and basically what I think it's saying, and and again Catherine Austin Fitz has said this even better, um, what I think it's saying is that is that you know, the secret space program, um, the 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 budget, you know, the the money as it's spent is being camouflaged by being you right. know, trans through these different agencies. It's really, in my opinion, that simple when we're talking about yeah. like example of the HUD thing, it's just really that simple. It's got to be channeled somewhere. And, uh, you know, and again, I'm coming from the perspective that a secret space program is not a bad thing. So, and, so essentially you're saying the ineffectiveness of all these departments or the apparent ineffectiveness is just sort of the way we're seeing it out here because the money is being spent on something. I mean, I would tend to agree with that, but yeah, you, you it, put it in a way that it gives, you, it gives you a different perspective on yeah. those uh, $10,000 toilet seats and $5,000 yes. monkey wrenches, right? Yeah. The $800 hammers and stuff. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, Let me, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Emily. So this is interesting to me. So uh, I get what you're saying on one sense, you know, I guess I have a, I I come from a a different scenario and I guess I have a different view of, of government in general. And I struggle with the idea that, and and this is not just in terms in regards to the secret space program. And I actually really get what you're saying on one level, but I struggle with this idea that people, that people having to pay for something that they don't know, they don't get to know anything about or understand, you know, there's very, I mean, even though the alternative research community has, you know, has gotten bigger and bigger, the number of people on the planet that are aware of these kinds of things is really small. You know what I mean? So I guess I struggle with that. I mean, I'm, 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 you know, I lean towards the voluntarist kind of uh, philosophy and whatnot. But I, I, something about the, I understand why you say what you say the way you say it. Like it makes sense to me on a different level. But you know, what, what do you think about that? That idea that people have to pay for things that they just don't get to know anything about. Well, um, those people we're talking about are citizens of the country that, you know, they they want to be protected by their military. They want to know that their government's protecting them from the threats that are out there. And when you're in um, a, a society that is as free as ours and some of the other ones that are as free as ours, um, you know, that costs. That costs money. That costs from time to time blood. And um, it's just the, the nature of reality. Yeah. And uh, again, I think what's going to change, I, I think what's going to assuage a lot of the suspicion that has grown up in our times, because let's be honest, the suspicion has grown up because of corrupt government people, yes. corrupt bureaucrats and the nasty things they've done. But here's the thing, what's going to assuage a lot of this concern is, like I said, that first time when this secret stuff saves our butts and people see they stand there and they watch it in the skies or they watch it all around them and it saves our butts okay they're gonna go oh i get it i understand thank you for doing this do you think we can have that what you just said without the corruption is there a way that we can get get rid of the corruption but still have what you're suggesting 
No, and and here, but this is why we have guys like I used to be. This is why we have federal agents. While you're doing these big things, you need to have the the men and women with the badges who are told you go look for the rotten apples in all this apparatus, and by God, you drag them into the light like the vampires that they are, and we'll throw them in jail and we'll punish them. Um, that, that, you know, that's why every police force even has an internal affairs department because, unfortunately. Human nature is that, you know, no, you're not going to be able to trust 100 percent of the people. And um, that's just the nature of reality. That's just the way it is. Yeah. We're never going to, um, you know, purify reality. Uh, right. yeah. That is uh, to to think that now I, I've said that, but I'll say this. Neither should we let government bureaucrats tell us. Oh, what we're doing here, we're not going to tell you about it, but it's just for your own good. So don't question it. And, oh, see that coming from the sky? That's an enemy. And look at us. We're protecting you because we know that technology exists um, to fake that kind of thing, right? Yeah. So yeah. It, it makes it difficult. It makes it understandable why people are suspicious. And... Um, it's just the way it is, though. And what, what it means is, is that we have to stay on our toes and we always have to be watchful and mindful and, and careful. And, um, you know, life ain't easy. Yeah. Well, I think that's where Emily and I were picking it up uh, pre-show tonight was basically the disgust that I, I we share right now with the political scene, which was so hyper ventilated over the course of the last 18 months of this this election and sure. the sensitivities that got upset and the polarization and you know I, I sort of walk a middle ground with most of this because i i don't find most politicians to be anywhere near what i can support um some are closer than others, so we can say at this point it's likely better than Mr. Trump won than Ms. Clinton, but <laughs> the perfect situation, not hardly. But what it did do is it squeezed out a bunch of ugliness in the process that I hope is something that we're going to see more of. I mean, and I'm talking here about the revelations of the pedophilia and all of the other things that came out at the end of the campaign. And I would like that to become part of a greater transparency in government, even in terms of the kind of people that we have in our government. I mean, look, you were in, you were in the FBI, you were in the Air Force and Special Operations. You know as well as I do, there are good people in government. There are good people in the military. And I, I think most, most, of the people, us, most of the people in government and most of the people in the military and most of the people in law enforcement are very good people. Yeah. Remember, it's, it's always that, that, that minority of rotten apples that you got to watch out for. So somehow or another, we've got to pour ourselves back into the book here because yeah. as all interesting right. as all this is, yeah. there's a place, place we want to go. <laughs> so we, we, we talked a little bit here about um, you know the black budget financing. I want to get down to brass tax on MK Ultra and why you think, aside from the obvious fact that the time frame we're talking about here, why you think specifically your father was potentially involved with and we'll just say a victim of MK Ultra programming. Well, um, again, I don't consider him a victim. I consider him a subject of it. Subject. I do, yeah. I, yeah, I do say in the book that it had some negative aspects, you know, in its, in its uh, it, you know, ultimate effect and results. But, um, you know, he was in the right place at the right time to have been a subject of this. Um, I learned when I was digging into it, when I was researching the book, some things you know I didn't know about MK Ultra, and that is that the U.S. Air Force was um, very much an enthusiastic customer of the agency, where MK Ultra and um, uh, uh, the the various operations, you know, those named operations, uh, were concerned, and that they had even in the fifties um, branched off and started their own. MK Ultra programs, as it were. And what's interesting is, even though in the 70s with the church 
committee, the CIA had to come clean and reveal all this stuff. That did not include the yeah. Air Force, the military programs. No, the Air Force's MKUltra program has never been forced to uh, reveal itself. So here you have my dad. He's in the air. Uh, oh, oh, and I, I have to add that the, uh, aviation medicine, U.S. Air Force aviation medicine were, you know, right there um, in the middle of this uh Air Force involvement with MK Ultra in the 50s, starting in the late 40s, going in the early 50s. So there's my dad in the late 50s. Um, his specialty falls within aviation medicine. There he is at the bases where you can point to MK Ultra, you know, uh, Air Force scientist um, yeah. presence. And I was told in the uh, late 90s, mid to late 90s, that hypnosis was used to suppress his memory. So being in the right place at the right time, the right branch, the right specialty, and the fact that I had been told by my source that he had indeed um, been hypnotically suppressed and um, being aware without going into it, um, being aware that, for example, the Air Force to this, you know, at least while I was in, you know, still used uh, hypnosis as an investigative tool in OSI, um, you know, to me, it becomes pretty obvious that uh, what my dad was subjected to was likely whatever was developed out of MK Ultra, or, and, and particularly by the Air Force's own version of it. Ultra. Yeah, no, that, I mean, there's a lot of stuff there to to poke at. That I, I I always point out to people that yeah, exactly, the CIA's mind control program was was revealed, but. I think all, all the different branches of the military, I think different, uh, different government agencies, I think uh, uh, weapons and mercenary companies, I think all of these in certain corporations, I think there are mind control programs that exist uh, with many different, many different places that, ha that, are, that branched off from the original and have certainly not only never stopped, but keep growing. And there are at this point thousands, if not tens of thousands of sub projects of what, what was originally called MKUltra. Yeah, or, or, at least, or at least, if not sub-projects, um, individual applications of yes. this yes. technology. Absolutely, I, I would agree with that. Um, so, you know, and, and I do make the distinction in the book also, remember, that this would not, this would, if this was, if I'm right about this, and this was what was done to my dad, this was not some dark secret thing that he didn't know where, you know, he wasn't aware was going on. This is something that most likely... He signed on and allowed because, you know, having been involved in operations and stuff, you know, they, they tell you, they go, look, uh, you know, this is classified to such and such level. And, you know, this is what's expected of you to keep it secret. And, and back then, the MK Ultra stuff was all new. It was a new toy. So yeah. I could see the Air Force um, not not in an evil way. I could see the Air Force honestly saying, you know, hey, maybe we should try this new mine technology to help keep things secure, you know, or to protect the operational security of a classified project. And the guys, I could see the Air Force, all the guys that are brought on board with this project, I could see them sitting there in the briefing room and being told by a guy at the front of the room, and uh, when you're done with this project, we will be using this, uh, this mine technology and uh, you will be hypnotically suppressed and I see this being done in a spirit of, guys, this will help you, you know, keep it secret. And I could see Air Force personnel saying, all right, man, you know, you salute sharply and you go, yeah, I'm in. Count me in. You know, saying, yes, I could see my dad, you know, if he was told this is one of the conditions of being involved in this project, I could see him agreeing to it. Yeah, I guess that, you know, I, I never considered that, like the mindset of somebody who would enlist in the military, particularly voluntarily, is different than someone who's not. So I, I never, I guess I think about these things from my perspective or from someone like me. And I'm certainly well, would I, never, I, I certainly would never sign up for the military, but the mindset is very different. So that's a great point. That's a really great point. And, well, and anybody who's gone in can tell you this. I'm, I'm not unique. When I went through my officer recruitment process, I can tell you one of the things I signed was to agree that, you know, if, if they wanted to test some type of uh, um, experimental medications on me, you yeah. know, you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you sign that just like because I was going to be an officer, I had to sign an agreement that if instructed to, yes, I would order the release of nuclear weapons. Give me the yeah. pen. I'll, I'll sign that one, too. Um, you know, and I don't regret signing that.
And I know that probably appalls and shocks some, you know, some of the peace lovers out there, but <laughs> you know, that's another conversation. Yeah. But, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, you do. You, you kind you know, you, you want to be part of it and, and it's presented openly, you know, so I could see this having been presented openly to my dad. He, he, I'm sure he full well knew what was going on. And remember also in the book, if w- what he says happened in Arizona was itself just a complete uh, 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 made up story, I also, as you recall, discuss in the book that maybe he never left right pad, that maybe he was just part of an MK for experiment itself, which again would have been agreed to. You know, yeah. it's like, yeah. okay. So well, as, you were, to, as, you know, as you were kind of unwinding that, and even in the course of reading the book, it occurred to me that we may be dealing with a number of different things, including screen memory here. Where Some synthetic environments, you, a bunch of stuff, yeah. You know, the real event, because as you point out in the book, there appears to have been an incident that your father recounted about the fatal shooting of a soldier at the hands of another soldier uh, playing basically a game of draw. And yeah. when I was reading that, I'm thinking back on this whole concept of what happened supposedly underground. And it becomes this question of which is the screen memory, which is real, how interchangeable is that? Because we know this goes into alien abduction more deeply, the concept of screen memories. So again, I'm speculating on your speculation here, but I'm wondering, is that, is that something that you've considered as well? Well, um, you know, uh, it's something that I did. I, I don't think I, I go into in the book because I was trying to avoid confusion for the reader. But you know, you bring up. <laughs> Are we specialize in confusion here? <laughs> you know, it, the the memory he had of the two guys on guard duty. You know, one of them shooting the other because they mishandled their weapon. Mm-hmm. Um, could. Self, indeed, yes, have been a screen memory to cover for the encounter with the underground people. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. It makes, wow. Right? That was my in- that was my impression reading it, and that's that's why I brought that up because I I think there's a reason why that's in that story, and it came out the way it did, and I and I agree. We'll muddy, you know, you give me give us a stick here. We'll muddy the waters with it because I it's like I said. This is what we do. I'm sitting here reading this from the perspective of somebody who has been deconstructing mind control operations and ufology for most of my life. So I look at things very differently than a lot of people in terms of how I think about things. You know, I understand a screen memory, once you penetrate it, will begin to reveal more data. So I don't know which is more meaningful to not muddy the waters or to speculate and say, you know, it's possible these two things are connected in some way. I I still find it very validating that um, that story came out in the book and the fact that it seems to have at least some tangential link to the event we would call the, the encounters. Right. Right. And, um, uh, uh, it, it just, it, it uncovers or, or suggests the, or just the layered nature yeah. of this whole, thing. and, um, even my own, um, real inability to definitively tell the reader, this is exactly what happened or that's exactly what happened. All I can tell you is, you know, based on my analysis, based on my research, ultimately what my gut instinct or my intuition uh, tells me that I accept. Um, but I still, it still greatly remains a mystery to me that I'm sharing with the reader. Um, you know, and I, I have no problem with that. I know there's readers out there. They want to be told this is the definitive answer to me. Um, I, I'm not that lazy as a reader myself. <laughs> you know, I, I like to read stuff that's, that's speculative. I, I, yes, I like absolutely. to have, yeah. I like to think for myself and I like to maybe pursue it further and, um, come to my own, uh, uh conclusion. And I know yeah. that there's just, People that they hate that 
Um, these are the people I know that hate when I, you know, as you know, you've read my books. I don't know how many times the word or the phrase, this is speculation pops up in my books. I think I found it. (laughs) And I still get, believe it or not, and I'll get it on this book. I'll get it from maybe some listening to this conversation. Absolutely. I still get the, the guy who says, Oh, there's, there's too much speculation here. And like, uh, or, or, uh, I don't, uh, the, the, my favorite one is I don't care for speculation. And what's interesting is they read my book and, uh, you know, uh, uh, how, how boring their life, life must be if they don't care for speculation. I, I actually, at this point, I mean, it is, it is important to do research and, and well, have a lot, of those, a lot of those guys have an agenda. For you sure. know that. Yeah. Their you know, agenda I, I, is so mud. It, people who do what what we do yeah. absolutely i mean while it is important to you know have hard, some hard and fast you know evidence and research and fact something at this point i'm much more interested in speaking with people who are willing to play what if than 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 just say i know that this is for, is for, you know, for a fact exactly what happened it's just not that you know the people who are creating these programs and doing these things they're not afraid to just try whatever comes to mind so we have to sure. not be afraid to follow where our mind goes with any of these ideas and if it's not your thing just go do something else ignore it you know i don't care <laughs> yeah. for basketball i don't like basketball you're not going to see me watching <laughs> basketball games or going to a basketball game and then complaining that it's basketball <laughs> thank you yeah, yeah. It's like, <laughs> basketball i hate it you know, it's like hey wait a minute now um, yeah. just go to the game we're watching yeah. it uh, so but, um, you know what are you going to do so another came, thing that came up just in that course of that conversation was you talked about and then it was in you know in the book and in our notes that um you talked about your dad's hypnosis having to do with the moon yes i was just going to bring this up thanks good one emily yeah, you, i want to hear i want to hear about that and then this is interesting. and then i have something that, uh, that maybe we'll see what you say and i want to connect something to that well all i know as far as my dad's situation is is what I was told by my source who I give a pseudonym for. I call him Colonel Lundy. All I know is he, when he told me that my dad was hypnotically suppressed, um, that, that episode in his life um, was hypnotically suppressed, that the way they uh, kept the hypnosis in place, the suppression in place, was to key it to the phases of the moon. Um, and it would refresh in his psyche at every full moon. And uh, I thought, you know, that's, uh, that, that, that's pretty slick. You know, uh, you know everybody's <laughs> moon, right? Yeah. Um, see that full moon once a month, sometimes twice. And uh, now he did tell me that regardless of that, over the years, it would start to break down. And of course it did. But um, that's what I was told. And then when I'm in there doing the research on MK Ultra, for a period of time, it is stated that the agency guys couldn't find a, a, a good trigger that, you know, they could put a command in someone's head and then have something that remotely, when they weren't with the person to trigger it themselves, would automatically trigger it. And my conclusion is it appears the Air Force solved that problem by what I was told I get this from what I was told about my dad. It appears that somebody in the Air Force, possibly the Dr. Monroe, who was an Air Force officer and then got involved with the agency MK Ultra Pro, uh, uh, program, um, he might have been the one. I don't know, but uh, but apparently somebody said, "Hey, why don't we try keying it to something somebody sees all the time, no matter where they are on the planet? And it's the moon in this case." It's, so it's, um, that that to me is a hint about me. the Air. Force own mk ultra research it's amazing to me randy go ahead they did kind of solve the problem and i I want to say this because when i was reading this as well what crossed my mind was this ultimately you could go you and cameron on this whole thing and you could just do full-on wipe of the personalities and we know that in a lot of cases that doesn't have permanence either but it does right. leave one with a rather screwed up individual for life but it can cause schizophrenia oh absolutely yeah. and, and and i've seen it in people 
But the other side of this is something that I think when you use the term mind control, it gets real focused on the mind, but we forget something. Our memory locus isn't just in our mind, but we have, we have cellular memory. We have, we have DNA level memories. And I suspect this is why it seems 20 years, 20 is about the time this starts to wear off. And I, it's not lost on me that if you've ever recovered a memory, um, a lot of times you're getting imagery, you're getting this jagged reality that kind of throws you because it feels foreign, but there's also a grounding aspect. And this is, just, you know, it's my experience, it's, it's my take on it, that in your, well, people say follow your, your, your gut level feelings, there's something in the cellular that begins to lead you to a place where there's a little bit more sense of affirmation uh, that what you're getting is true. In other words, I think mind control is a misleading term in the sense that reprogramming a human being is more of, I'll say more full spectrum biology than just the mind. I don't know if you agree with that or, or not. No, I, I, yeah, I, I see, I understand, you know, your, your concept that you're saying it's, uh, uh, yeah, control um, is a little limited. Um, it, it might just be one aspect of a very limited um, ability. Um, you, you're right. It's more of a, of a, you know, you can understand more and you can maybe where you can't control, you know, you can influence. Influence might yeah. be yes. yeah. most rare. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, I... I I think it's fascinating because I know I spend a lot of time talking to people about these topics and it does seem like when trying to recover memories from these kinds of things that you do have this thing where you're, you're making progress, you're making progress. And then it seems like you're sort of pushed back and that idea of every time you see the full moon that happening. And also the way that even goes into what you were saying about a more physiological or cellular memory particularly for women, how connected our physiology is to the cycles of the moon. But I'm sure there exists, you know, that connection for men. So I think of those things, it's fascinating that, you know, that every time there's a full moon, we get pushed back a little bit. And over time, we can still break through it. But, you know, it's kind of like a two step forward, one step back kind of thing that keeps, sure. that, that keeps it suppressed. Also, I think about, um, I think the guy's name is David Griffin. You, you interviewed him years ago, Randy. And he yes. talks about, and other people talk about this as well, about how when people die, that do, does our soul or does something go to the moon and get our memory of this time, lifetime erased so that when we come back, we have to start all over. And I just wonder if that, if what they discovered was a, a modern application of something that's been known since ancient times by some kind of ancient controlling system or whatever. And that it's like the miniature version of people dying and going towards the light or going towards the moon, having their memory wiped and having to start all over. Sure. Um, my my view, you know, and on another topic, um, I am personally I'm convinced that reincarnation is real, and um, I have uh, come to a, a personal conclusion. Um, others can agree with me or not; uh, it doesn't matter to me. It doesn't change my position, and that is that um, because we are intended to focus on the life at hand we experience what's called a veil of amnesia when we pass from, you know, that, that, that phase in between the last, the past life and the current one mm -hmm. so that we remember that past life. So uh, as much, so, so we surely don't um, recall where it is. We are in between lives because right. we're supposed to focus. We are supposed to be all in, uh, you know, in the given life, we are supposed to to act and operate within that given life is that's that's what there is that's all there is um so that we'll focus and do what it is that in that particular life we're supposed to do and i think this is a similar thing that you're talking about where it's not so much it, in in what i just described it's not so much a memory wipe as yeah. it is a memory block yeah no you know it's i haven't really thought about it that way but that is a fascinating point yeah yeah, there's something definitely to that. That's interesting. I, I don't disagree because I think within 
the reality construct that we live in, first off, I don't know how much human beings can handle. Uh, if you had memories of a hundred lifetimes, is that useful? Is that, I, I, I like to think personally that we're on a trajectory, that there's an arc of the soul and that basically we are supposed to, God, I hate the word ascension. What do I, what do I want to use here, Emily? E evolve, another bad term. I don't know. We're on a, we're hopefully on a growth, uh, an upward trajectory yeah. in terms of, of spirituality. So I'd like to think that somewhere in the play of all this, we're working with the tools we have now, but we're at least building on the basis of something that came before us, at least in a, a linear chronology. Yeah. You know, after <laughs> like, like maybe, like maybe, you know, carry carry over some of the wisdom if not the exact details or memories of the prior life some of the carry because some of the wisdom and knowledge yeah yeah probably more of a holographic retention in terms of you know a general base i mean we know that there's differences in people nobody likes this either because everybody's populous now but there's differences in intelligence genetic makeup um personality profiles i mean all people are not the same we're just going to need we need to get over that so i guess what i'm talking about is just each individual person has the developmental cycle that they're going through at any given time i'm not sure how we got how did we get on that subject <laughs> <laughs> the moon the moon yeah, line the that was it that was it yeah the memory wiping Okay. No, it, it is. I just had a, I had a complete brain fart there. <laughs> so we're kind so of, I have, a question. I, I have one, one last question for you, Walter. Um, yeah. So you have these curiosities about your dad. Do you ever wonder about yourself, if you've ever been subject to any of these programs? Uh, I don't go into that. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> I guess the final, you know, the final aspect of this is, um, you know, because we've got endless subjects, but we've pulled from a broad spectrum of the book. But in, in the end, um, your father, your father's period of time here, 1948, is clearly the epicenter of when all of this stuff is developing. It's like he seems to have been in the right place at the right time. He has the right profile. Um, conjecture and speculation aside your best assessment is that you know some weird shit happened here and somehow or another he got caught in the middle of forces that, that really are historical i mean i you know we're, we're well it's almost 2017 so we're almost 60 years 70 years out now on some of this stuff um we're now able to assess this age a little bit differently. And I would say that, you know, if you talk about MK Ultra, you talk about the so-called alien abduction, you're talking about dark stuff. Is there a, is there a light side to this? I mean, have, have we benefited? Have we learned something in all of this? And what do you think your dad's, summation of it would be if he could look back on this open open-mindedly i know that's speculation well, what he what he did say was that um the turning of the, the labeling of roswell being a, an extraterrestrial thing he said was just wrong yeah you know that's not what it was um and the idea of not telling the public that there were others, uh, be they ET or hidden race, um, he felt was uh, wrong because, at least speaking for the hidden race he was aware of, he said they are no threat to us. You know, it's not going to send the people into a frenzy. So he, he was against that. Um, and again, like I said earlier, I don't think he would have had a problem with, you know, um, them doing this to him to help uh, strengthen operational security. But it's interesting, you know, you're talking about abductions. I, you know, we assume that we're talking about the negative abduction experience, but um, going back to uh, the lore and the mythology, yeah. the abduction experiences involved with that, um, particularly with the secret commonwealth, the fairy folk, the Tuatha Dé Um, when I read them, they don't 
sound all negative to me. In, in fact, several of them are, much of them are quite the contrary. Um, it's just a different world. Um, you know, and uh, so to me, you got to look at the specific, um, the specific case because I don't think all abduction yeah. is maybe we just hear about the bad ones, right? Yeah. Um, it's kind of like when they talk about, you know, our intelligence community and, and, you know, people have this negative view because, oh, look at all these bad things that happen. Well, I, I, you know, as somebody who's worked in that world, um, that's because it's the bad ones are the ones you hear about. You don't yeah. hear about the ones that are successful, and there's a reason for that. So I think, you know, there, there might be a lot of folks out there that have been abducted to another world or the other world, and uh, it, they're happy. Um, and we just <laughs> want to hear about it. So, um, you know, we're, we're not aware that there are, are good stories about this, too, because, you know, the other thing you need to think of, think about is that, you know, the very nature of, you know, being abducted, that implies that, you know, you're, you're being taken someplace that you didn't know about and others didn't know about. And, you know, it could be that this other race has a good thing. So why tell everybody about your good thing? You know, so that all the knuckleheads will, because you know how people are today, <laughs> particularly people in America. If I got a right to know everything and they're entitled to this, that, and the other. And by golly, if you haven't stood on another, by God, you owe it to them to allow the masses. To that's come right. Because they've yeah. got a, and I, to me, that's, BS. Yeah, that's stupid. <laughs> yeah. For sure. I, I, if I had such a good thing like that, I'd keep it secret too. Yeah, you know, no. It, I mean, we, yeah. Especially with, if civilization built that place. You know what I'm saying? Um, yeah. You know, tough. That's why the breakaway civilizations, you know, if they're the ones who built it up and they're the ones that went out and found the resources, um, you know, it's theirs. And not everybody has a right to be a member of that club, and that's just tough if uh, you're not you're not selected. Sorry, I'm going to get a lot of hate. On well, that. You know, actually, Walter, I, I I'm actually kind of enjoying this. You bring up some I, I have too. No, because <laughs> I, we're not sycophants here, and 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 you know, yeah. we need to entertain. We need to entertain. You know, these there's so much. Like I said earlier, populism, egalitarianism out there. And then, you know, there's going to be the inevitable pants sweaters that are going to scream, well, you're a bunch of elitists, you're, you're cabal, you're, well, you know, quite honestly, I can't speak for anybody else but myself. I'm not sitting around worrying about the breakaway civilization. I'm, I'm cons <laughs> the one thing that, that bothers me is. If they're going to do these things, they have to finance their own operations. I, I'm bothered by the fact that it's very clear. And I interviewed Kath, Catherine Austin Fitz. Oh, yeah. you know, I mean, she was very clear about this. You know, she was stunned. An undersecretary of housing at HUD it finds out that her boss is actually an army general. And she's well, stunned. But, but, but I, I take exception to that. A break, a true breakaway civilization, yes, should fund itself. A secret space program put together by our Defense Department that is ostensibly used to defend us, you mm -hmm. know, uh, or for our benefit, uh, I got no problem with my tax dollars going to that. Now, now, make, the distinction there. Make, make the distinction there. There's yeah, a breakaway yeah. civilization, and then there's just merely a classified program, right? They're two different things. Mm -hmm. So many times people, people assume that the secret space program means breakaway civilization. No, no, no. That's not necessarily no, the case. That. Different things. I, I, I think they're different things, absolutely. They, they, they certainly, um, you know, can be and should be different things. Now, you know, and maybe one grows out of the other, sure. Yeah. But I, was gonna, I, I always think of the breakaway civilization as possibly being made up of people who used to work on the secret space programs so they understand those technologies and they and once they're done working on whatever programs they've worked on, then they've endeavored to, to build this other society because they're not allowed to tell the people about the information that they have anyways. They want to do something with it because that's what they do. That's kind of how I always yeah. look at it. But if they do it on their own resources or find, you no know, problem. yeah, that's fine. That's their business. Yeah. 
Well, I, you know, I got to say, this has been an unexpected conversation we've had because I think we went into some interesting stuff. And, and in a way, I think a lot of it was in the spirit of the book. I hope we didn't pull you off too many, uh, too many uh, things tonight. I, 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 I want to tack something onto what I just said. Yes. Where, where the breakaway civilization becomes a problem is if they start setting themselves up to lord it over all of us. And right. that, that is what I think the NIMSA are doing. Uh-huh. That, I identify the, the New World Order, the neocons, um, the globalists, yes. okay, progressives, the socialists, all, all of this. Yes. I associate yes. them with the NIMSA. And because the NIMSA, when you look at that, and I've written about it elsewhere, they do want to control the world. And that's where it becomes a problem. And so would you say that your 1903 civilization, that they're different than that? Oh, yes. Oh, I, well, I think they grew out of a, a, a natural opposition and a, a material opposition to the NIMSA. Um, and, and people have asked me, and I say, look, in my opinion, the 1903 are either the good guys or at worst, at worst, are neutral guys. Benevolent. benevolent. I think, yeah. personally, I think they're, they're between being the classic good guy and the neutral guys. I, I, and, and to me, that, that makes them essentially the good guys. If, exactly. you know, opposing NIMSA, and I do believe they oppose NIMSA, um, I wrote an interesting thing on that on my blog that involves Donald Trump. That yes, I point I saw that. Blogspot.com. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I you actually in that article you actually pulled the straw on something that I've been speculating on was that something shifted, a balance of power shifted, and it did it quite unexpectedly and quite rapidly because I saw it literally happen the night that the returns were coming in for the election. So, yeah, I, I, I you know, there's a certain amount of optimism there. I try to suppress that, but you know, I do. See <laughs> <laughs> Don't suppress. It. Let yourself enjoy some optimism. <laughs> he wouldn't. He wouldn't be Randy if he didn't do that, Walter. <laughs> Here, here's the thing: when you when you neuter the nefarious and evil with a capital E Clinton political machine, yeah, you know exactly. somebody power. You know somebody of power has behind the scenes jammed it up Bill and Hillary's backsides. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And told yeah. them that their time is over. Enjoy your golden years. Yeah. Um, because, yeah, I think they were, I think they, I think what happened was they came up against their time coming to an end. Yeah. And I think they were, it was communicated to them. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean they're not going to try, you know, silly ass creepy things, but, you know, because that's just their, their, um, their nature, their, yeah. their low, low character, but I will not bash them anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, uh, I, I, I think I would tend to agree with that. So. So good stuff. Good stuff. Um, really enjoyed the conversation, Walter. Uh, uh, there's so many places we could have gone and I'm really glad we just got a chance to unwind and, and go where we went because it, it this book will be something different for every everybody that reads it, and, and I encourage people to read it. Um, if you have an interest in MK Ultra UFOs, Black Projects, all of that sounds negative, but at the end of the day, what we're really doing is we're just tossing down puzzle pieces on the floor, picking them up, putting them together. We all have some of that, and we all have uh, uh, kind of the data that we gather and this book is very affirming in a lot of the stuff that, uh, especially that Emily and I have researched. Anything else that we didn't ex- did bring up that you want to bring up or be heard saying going out? No, I, I, I think, uh, you know, you guys did a good job, you know, uh, covering the basics. I truly appreciate being on the show and I appreciate your uh, interest in, um, uh, you know, what I've written. This book is the most personal of the ones I've written, yes, and yes. Um, I, I hope it does, you know, lend um, an opportunity for the reader to just consider a different perspective on some of these topics that I, I believe were sincerely and genuinely involved in my dad's experience. Um, so, you know, this is something, a story that has been in my life for decades, and 
I just thought it was time for me to take a close look at it and get it out there and see what other people think. So I appreciate it. Good stuff. Good stuff. Walter Bosley, the author of Empire of the Wheel and the current book, uh, Shimmering Light. That's available um, on Amazon. Links will go up with the show, so don't worry about that. If we screwed anything up, the website is empirethewheel.blogspot.com. Walter, thanks for coming on Off Planet Radio with us. We really, really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you, Walter. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Good night. All right. Bye-bye. This is Off Planet Radio.